thank you for having me again to the Beaverton Historical Society. Tonight I am talking about my latest book, which is entitled A Glimpse into History. And it's about what prominent people have said about nature through the years uh, and the need to conserve it. And it's a story of how a culture of nature appreciation arose in this state. Uh, and it was one that was embraced by a, a broad spectrum of people in many walks of life. And it was very surprising. And the underlying premise of the book is that a culture of valuing nature had to be laid down before we could have many public policies adopted in the state that uh, reflected a concern with nature and the need to protect it. Now, this idea of appreciating nature uh, arose at a very early time. As soon as uh, European people started coming into Oregon, of course, not everybody agreed, but gradually the numbers who were concerned about it uh, grew. And uh, in response to that, uh, the number of policies adopted to protect nature grew also. Now here's how the people that I cite. This book includes many quotes, sometimes short, sometimes longer, of what these prominent people in Oregon history had to say about nature. Now some historians have asserted that when the pioneers first came to Oregon, they were too busy just trying to survive uh, to pay any attention to nature and the beauties of it. But is this really true? Here's what some of them actually said. Uh, for instance, when in 1845 Joel Palmer made the first recorded descent of Mount Hood, he exclaimed, quote, I had never before looked upon a sight so nobly grand. No pen can give an adequate description of the scene, unquote. It's in 1845. And in 1857, when H.L. Pittock was the first, first to actually get to the top of Mount Hood, he agreed and said, quote, the view was indescribably grand, unquote. He incidentally, as you know, was the founder of the Oregonian. But before that, he was a climber. In 1852, when pioneer Abigail Scott Dunaway suddenly saw the Cascades for the first time from the crest of the Blue Mountains, she beheld, quote, the majestic proportions of Mount Hood rising above the lesser heights, with Hood, the patriarch of the solitudes, his hoary head uplifted in the shimmering air, unquote. She was later noted, of course, as the leader of the suffragists in Oregon. But first, she commented the moment she first saw the Cascades on their beauty. And before then, when the explorers were still at work, Lieutenant William Broughton of the British Vancouver Expedition described his first view of the mountain that in 1792 he named Mount Hood. He said, quote, we had a beautiful view of a very remarkable high mountain whose summit was covered with snow and presented a very grand view, unquote. He was then coming up the Columbia River. And visitors to Oregon kept praising Mount Hood. In an 1888 visit, John Muir described it in these terms, quote, 
as looming immensely high in all the glory of the alpine glow at every turn, solitary, majestic, and awe-inspiring, the ruling spirit of the landscape, unquote. And much later, noted landscape architect John Charles Olmsted on analyzing the beauty of Mount Hood said, quote, the near views of Mount Hood are very striking and beautiful, certainly unusual, if not altogether unique. There are elements of beauty here scarcely excelled by any mountain in the world, unquote. He was from Massachusetts. Referring to the spire of Mount Hood, he said, quote, the, sh the sheer faces of the mountain offer an exceptionally beautiful type of reflection, such as can rarely be seen in the more massive mountains, unquote. He's referring to Mount Rainier and, and Mount Shasta. Early Oregonians also expressed wonder at the sight of Crater Lake. On seeing it in 1875, journalist Francis Fuller Victor wrote, quote, a choking sensation arose in our throats. The water of Crater Lake is of the loveliest blue imaginable in the sunlight and a deep indigo in the shadow of the cliffs." Unquote. When activist William Gladstone Steele first saw the lake ten years later, he proclaimed, quote, an overmastering conviction came to me that this wonderful spot must be saved, wild and beautiful, just as it was for all future generations. And it was up to me to do something, unquote. He did and is now celebrated as the father of the national park there. In testifying before Congress in 1887 in support of such legislation to make Crater Lake a national park, the head of the U.S. Geological Survey, John Wesley Powell, said, quote, there are probably not many natural objects in the world which will impress the average spectator with such a deep sense of the beauty and majesty of nature as Crater Lake, unquote. And future Forest Service Chief Gifford Pinchot agreed, saying, quote, Crater Lake is one of the great natural wonders of this continent, unquote. Now, after William Gladstone Steele persuaded the president to withdraw land around the lake, then he had to return to lobby in the nation's capital to protect the withdrawal, dispatching this urgent message to his collaborator in Oregon, Judge John Waldo. Quote, the life of our reservation is simply trembling in the balance. If I can get a prompt and decisive support on the Oregon end of the line, I do believe it can be saved, unquote. At the critical moment, a decade later, Gifford Pinchot was the one who cleared the way in Congress for Crater Lake to be made a national park. And people in Oregon kept finding soul-stirring exper experiences in nature. For instance, orator Frank Branch Riley wrote, quote, Close by are the rapids and deep blue pools of singing mountain streams, refreshing all summer long with the chill of newly minted, melted snow. We enter into the shadowy aisles and under the green canopies of ancient cathedral forests. 
sanctuaries of wildlife, wild beauty, wildflowers, and wild waters, unquote. And many years later, as an outgoing U.S. Senator, Mark Hatfield described what was at stake at Opal Creek in these terms, quote, Opal, that's an area uh, east of uh, Salem uh, in the Cascade. He says, Opal Creek represents one of Western Oregon's last remaining intact low elevation areas of old growth. But it is much more than that. It is a powerful symbol. It is an inspiration. It is a place of spiritual renewal and exploration. To walk among the century-old hemlocks and cedars inspires awe and instills perspective on life itself." Unquote. Changing the focus now a little. After settlement had progressed, those who had celebrated the beauties of nature began to see abuses emerging, such as fraudulent claims for public lands, forests being ravaged, too many salmon being taken, the habitat for waterfowl being drained, and devastating pollution. Now there are some in academia who teach their students that they should not use strong language in public statements or ones giving vent to emotions. But I submit that some situations do deserve to be condemned with strong language. For instance, in 1907, attorney Charles Erskine Scott Wood wrote about the fraudulent claims for public lands saying, quote, timberlands have been stolen right and left by fraudulent entries and fictitious entrymen. Thieves have been carrying off all the valuable lands, unquote. In 1915, Governor Oswald West denounced those who do this and stand against conservation, saying, quote, representatives of organized greed and monopoly oppose every measure of the conservation movement, their sole desire being freedom to loot the public domain. They desire to seize every opportunity to poison the mind of the public against the policies of the federal government." Unquote. And nowadays, novelist Ursula Le Guin unfortunately recently deceased, denounced those who occupied the Malheur Wildlife Refuge for so long. In a public letter she wrote, quote, ranting about the Constitution does not get you a permit to break the law, to fail to pay your grazing fees, to cut a rancher's fences, to steal government cars, to misuse public property and to keep a lot of American citizens under a stupid, brutal reign of terror for days on end. How much longer enough is enough?" Unquote. Changing the focus again. Concern with overcutting the state's forests did not begin with the demise of the northern spotted owl in the late 1980s. Back in 1911, Governor Oswald West foresaw, quote, 50 years will see every stick of this vast forest cut and sawed if the present demand keeps up, unquote. In 1921, Governor Ben Alcott reminded us of the value of forests, saying, quote, Without forests, our mountains would be rocky, forbidding eminences. Our streams would dwindle into rivulets, and our lakes would be shorn of the sylvan fringes 
that make them entrancing, unquote. In 1928, forestry expert David T. Mason warned that, quote, our national timber budget fails to balance by about 37 billion board feet. If we continue as at present, with the timber budget so badly out of balance, we may expect to use up our timber in about 35 years, unquote. That's down from west 50 years. Finally, in 1952, resource expert Charles McKinley, a Reed College professor, declared, quote, timber is being used and destroyed three times as rapidly as it's being produced. The Pacific Northwest must choose between two alternatives. One, high industrial activity, merely pursued for a few decades, then dropping to the stillness of dead communities falling one by one into decay. Or two, a planned program, a reduced annual harvest, adjusted to a total perpetual yield. This is the stark reality, unquote. And I should add, I think we made the wrong choice. When the reality of habitat losses for the spotted owl became apparent in 1991, federal judge William Dwyer wrote in a judgment, quote, the most significant implication from our new knowledge regarding old growth forest ecology is that logging these forests destroys not just trees, but a complex, distinctive, and unique ecosystem, unquote. Then quote again, the most recent violation of the National Forest Management Act exemplifies a deliberate and systematic refusal by the Forest Service to comply with laws protecting wildlife." Unquote. And now research ecologist Jerry Franklin insists that, quote, we really need all stages of successional development of forests in our federal landscapes Big old trees aren't just oddities and objects of, of interest. We need to have populations of big old trees present in much of our forest landscape in order to provide the kinds of habitat that we need for a lot of our wildlife." Unquote. And of course, the struggle goes on. In testimony to Congress in 2009, Plant ecologist Dominic Delasana observed, quote, that in Oregon, coastal old growth forests store more carbon per acre than any other forest on earth, unquote. And forest activist Andy Kerr recently wrote a guest editorial saying, quote, the few mills that require large logs, now found only on federal lands, will soon find that the social license to log these large old trees has expired and won't be renewed." Unquote. Changing focus again. Sometimes people with the most unexpected backgrounds have turned out to be champions of nature and have show, even shown reverence for it. In 1887, State Supreme Court Judge John B. Waldo it was stunned by what he had seen in exploring the Cascades. Quote, what woods I've seen, the fair, unaltered wilderness where no sound is heard where no track is seen save that made by its native inhabitants." Unquote. In time, he became known 
as the John Muir of Oregon. The designer of the celebrated Columbia Gorge Highway, Samuel Lancaster, a highway engineer, vowed in 1916, saying, I quote, I pledged myself that none of this wild beauty should be marred or it could be prevented. This highway was so built that not one tree was felled or even one fern was crushed unnecessarily, unquote. And another highway engineer, Samuel Boardman, became the first state park director and another champion of nature, observing that, quote, the more the world civilizes the primitive, the more barbaric we become, unquote. Bank officer Ben Olcott, who became governor in 1921, exclaimed to the legislature, quote, God fashioned here the primeval wilderness and earthly paradise, which we must preserve as nearly as possible, unquote. He became the founder of the scenic beauty movement in Oregon. I might add that it's common to imagine the term wilderness did not come into use in America until the Forest Service started using the term in the late 1930s. But note here that leaders in Oregon were using the term as early as the 1880s. It was something they chose to talk about and celebrate. Again, changing focus. Many Oregonians believe that Governor Oswald West saved Oregon's beaches. What he really did was to stop the process of selling off Oregon's tidelands. That began the struggle over protecting the state's beaches from various threats, which culminated in a 1969 decision of the Oregon Supreme Court that stopped encroachment on the dry sands. In 1913, Governor West pointed out that Oregon had already suffered the loss of 20 miles of tidelands. These were the overflow areas along the beaches. He said, quote, we've got to stop doing this. Let's not sell any more tideland. It's too valuable. No selfish interest should be permitted to destroy this great birthright of our people, unquote. In 1967, the state treasurer, who later became governor, Bob Straub, had led a courageous campaign that kept the new highway off Nestucca Spit, thereby discouraging building any more highways down Oregon's beaches. In this campaign, he urged that, quote, our beaches be saved for recreation, for scenic beauty, as places where the awe and majesty of nature, the force and the reach of the ocean can be observed and contemplated without the distraction and danger of vehicles zooming past, unquote. Now, many think the conservation movement nationally, as well as in Oregon, only woke up to the problems posed by pollution at the time of Earth Day in 1970. But actually, through much of the 20th century, conservationists in Oregon had been concerned about the impact of pollution on both people and wildlife. As early as 1905, Oregon State Board of Health warned about the dangers of pollution in the Willamette River, with the Fish and Game Commission soon saying that, quote, many of the most beautiful streams are being transformed into public sewers, unquote. In a 1927 report, the Portland City Club warned of the danger of contracting typhoid fever from bathing in streams or lakes that are used as depositories for untreated sewage, unquote. 
An anti-stream pollution league was then formed to urge reform with the Oregon Agricultural College, used to now what called Oregon State University, has found that the Willamette River is, was, quote, is to be grossly polluted in its lower reaches, unquote. 1931, Governor Julius Meyer warned that, quote, the wastes of industry along with the filth of cities are dumped into public waters to such an extent that some streams are like open sewers spreading disease to people and destroying fish life, unquote. In a 1937 broadcast, Byron Carney speaking on behalf of the Stream Pur Purification League, you might add those broadcasts were done on behalf of the Isaac Walton League. He observed that when, quote, mills, factories, and cities dump their waste into the rivers, our game fish cannot live, not only because of the absence of oxygen, but also from the lack of food. Which, is been, which has been destroyed by this pollution, unquote. He went on to say, quote, fish cannot live without oxygen in the water any more than human beings can live without oxygen in the air, unquote. The result of all of this, this campaigning, was that in 1938, by a three to one margin, the voters of Oregon at last decided to do something about this pollution, establishing the state sanitary authority. But it still took many decades to stop all the polluters, especially the pulp mills. Even as late as the 1960s, the pollution was so bad that as a newscaster, Tom McCall lamented, quote, America was wild and beautiful. But there's a dream of a dying America where the waters are so poisoned by the waste of man and the breeze is strangled by the fires and, and fumes of civilization." Unquote. Speaking of the waste generated by the pulp industry, he pointed out that, quote, where these wastes are not treated in a safe manner, the effluent becomes an oxygen gulping, slime making scourge. It destroys fish life, fouls fishing gear, and fishing boats." Unquote. And others were concerned about the destruction of the habitat for other forms of wildlife like waterfowl. Writing in the mid-1920s, William Finley described the fate of the lower Klamath marshes, which had largely been drained for farming. Quote, one of the most unique features in North America is gone. It's a crime against our children. Their birthright has been sold for a mess of pottage, unquote. I might add that Finley was celebrated for the photographs that he and Herman Bowman took of seabirds at their camps on offshore rocks. Finley toured the nation telling his story. Among other things, they were the founders of the Portland Audubon Society. Nature writer Tom McAllister wrote of them, quote, their daring do captivated audiences nationwide. Finley packed the lecture halls. When President Theodore Roosevelt saw their work, he must have bellowed, bellowed his bully bully, for he made all three Oregon sites federal refuges by executive order. Three arch rocks in 1907 became the first federal bird refuge in the West. Lower Klamath and Malheur Lakes were designated the next year. And even before pollution took its toll on salmon, the head of Oregon's, in 1909, the head of Oregon's Conservation Commission, we then had one, Joseph Teal, described the impact of too much competition for fish 
and too much take. To quote the result was what might have been expected, a steadily diminishing supply, a magnificent fish threatened with extinction, an industry with destruction, a natural source with exhaustion. Such a wicked policy carries with it its own condemnation." Unquote. A few years later, Governor Oswald West joined him in deploring the trend in salmon stocks. Quote, Once the streams of the state ran full with fish, but inadequate laws have permitted the hand of greed to dip into our waters until the salmon runs have begun to disappear." Unquote. Later, salmon stocks were decimated by other causes, degraded habitat, and dams which posed barriers as on the lower Snake River. For a long time, federal judges in Oregon have tried to get the Fisheries Agency of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, to move more effectively to save the remaining salmon stocks. In 2010, Judge James Redden found that the Federal Fisheries Agency had failed to follow his instructions, saying, quote, the resulting biological opinion was a cynical and transparent attempt to avoid responsibility for the decline of listed Columbia and Snake River salmon and steelhead. I find that irreparable harm will result to listed species as a result of the operation of the dams on the lower Snake River." Unquote. In 2016, federal judge Michael Simon found, quote, that NOAA fisheries merely recited or ignored all the new information and did not apply any of it. The effects of climate change may not only reduce the effectiveness of habitat mitigation efforts and cause additive harm, but may result in a catastrophic event that can quickly imperil the listed species." Unquote. Another, changing the focus again, another judge wrote an important dissent on another matter. This was the dissent of U.S. Supreme Court William O. Douglas, who had many connections to Oregon and who I knew. His dissent was on the question of who should have access to the federal courts. In his famous dissent in the 1972 case of the Sierra Club versus Morton, which I caused to have been brought, he discussed his hope that all natural features would have standing to appear in court, saying, quote, all of the forms of life would then stand before the court. Of course, those inarticulate members of the ecological group cannot speak, but those people who have so frequented the place as to know its value and wonders will be able to speak for the entire ecological community." Unquote. Well, we did not win that case. The case did significantly broaden the rules of standing so that you no longer had to have a financial interest to file suit. You just had to have a real interest. And after that, uh, many environmental lawsuits were f filed in federal court as well as by many other types of of nonprofit associations. I guess I should add that I spent my career as the national staff head of the Sierra Club. Today, many people dis dismiss politicians as being uninspiring mediocrities. But I submit that many of Oregon's governors have spoken moving terms about their hopes for Oregon and its environment and the progress we've made. In 1970, Governor Tom McCall reminded us 
that, quote, we have passed more environmental quality regulations in 30 months in Oregon than most states pass in 30 years, unquote. He went on to say, quote, Oregon is in a bellwether position. What happens to Oregon is going to set a precedent for the rest of the nation. It is a fitting and traditional role for Oregon. We have exerted over a century of leadership in making innovations, unquote. In 1997, Dr. John Kitzhaber spoke of the, what he thought was the essence of Oregon it has something to do with the quote, it has something to do with the place itself, its natural beauty, its variety of landscapes. It has something to do with us, our reverence for the land and open spaces that makes us skeptical of growth. Whatever it is, whatever its components, Oregon has some quality that we cannot define but we can all recognize it is why we are here. It's why we chose to come. It's why we chose to stay, unquote. And in, in 2007, Governor Ted Kulingoski told the legislature, quote, Oregon is a state that beckons to us to find where the sunrise begins and the river ends, part nature, part spirit, part memory, and part dream. A generation ago, Oregon led the nation by preserving our coastline and beaches and by our stewardship of public land. Today, we must lead on global warming. Where Oregon goes, America will learn to follow." Unquote. And two years later, in his State of the State address, he said, quote, there is a green revolution stirring in America, and Oregon is the beating heart of that revolution. But it won't last for long if we call a timeout on our move toward investing in renewable energy and green technology, end quote. And recently, Governor Kate Brown has warned, quote, Oregon's unique and special way of life is being stalked by climate change. Unchecked, it will have a devastating effect on all that we as Oregonians hold dear, unquote. And in conclusion, let me say that Oregon activist Cameron LaFollette has left us with a profound thought in her new book about the rights of nature. She said, quote, many will dismiss the central thesis of this book out of hand. Some will argue that a right of nature thesis is anti-people and cares nothing for human lives and needs. Nothing could be further from the truth. There are no jobs on a dead planet. We argue that no economic system can flourish and human life itself cannot flourish if nature does not flourish first." Unquote. Uh, let me say just a word that concludes my prepared remarks, let me say that this book uh, has now won a number of awards, including from the Independent Booksellers Association of America, and uh, it has also been uh, given some wonderful reviews. In the Seattle Review of Books, Kevin Winter said, quote, take time to enjoy this immensely enjoyable book, unquote. When uh, the award presentation was being developed that I spoke of, uh, Tish Davidson wrote, quote, a must read for anyone interested in the evolution of the environmental movement and its future, unquote. 
another reviewer said, quote, a beautiful book shaped by a beautiful idea, unquote. And uh, I would be glad to answer your questions. The book sells for $24.95. Uh, and uh, it has two signatures of colored images taken from museum quality uh, paintings of scenery in Oregon. And uh, it's the first time they've all been put together. Many of them were by permission of the Portland Art Museum and the Oregon Historical Society. And uh, everybody that I've talked to who has read the book really liked it. And I think you will too. Thank you. <laughs> anybody like to ask anything? Oh, I had a question. Uh, all the mentions were about the dams on the Lower Snake. What's, what's the difference between them and the dams on the Columbia? Uh, mainly, the dams in the Columbia are troubled too. But at that point, the salmon coming downstream on the Snake River have not had to confront most of the, or a lot of the dams on the Columbia, which are upstream from their confluence, and. Uh, uh, so I think the fishery biolog biologists think that they particularly take a very heavy toll. Uh, I think your point's well taken that even if they were to get by those dams, they're still three or four ahead on the Columbia. Yeah. Uh, but uh, they all agree that that's one of the biggest problems that they face. I won't try to do more expert evaluation of those problems. I, in the book, just quoting people who have a lot of expertise. I, uh, growing up in Oregon, and traveling 26 to the coast, I, I'm just appalled at what I see. It is horrendous. And I'm thinking, Okay, they got their little sign, these trees were planted, blah, blah, blah. How many years before those hillsides are covered again? I mean, it's going to be 50 years before. Well, there's some interesting things in this book about that very problem. Uh, when, when Ben Alcott was a progressive Republican, when he was governor, and I said he the founder of the Oregon Scenic Beauty Movement. He, I have some quotes in the book that are at length that I didn't get to, about how appalled he was at the sight of that very thing on the trip to Seaside. And, uh, well, no more to Cannon Beach. To, and the state park agency arose out of his reaction against the, all of that logging and the failure to preserve roadside strips, at, at the very least. Uh, so uh, it, it, there's an interesting evolution of, of uh, some efforts to counteract that. Yeah, it just seems like, I, I don't know who's logging those hillsides off. Well, the ownership has changed a lot in recent years. Most of the one time, well, not all, but most of the one time lumber companies that operated in Oregon have now been bought up by real estate investment trusts in, in, on Wall Street and have very short operating horizons and very little interest in conservation. I thought we had replanting, not laws, but whatever in force. Well, what we have is replanting and the failure after they're planted to manage them by doing uh, periodic thinnings. So we have now one of the great problems of smoke in cities is that we have all this fuel out there and nobody doing anything about properly thinning and, uh, and the old growth that they, they largely removed 
uh, it was a much moister forest, less fire prone, fires burned small areas, and it had thick bark that resisted burning. Uh, all of that's been removed. And so we just, and all the promises we had from the lumber companies that we'll replant and we'll look after it and all, and free farms forever, all that balderdash, they didn't do any of that. They just took off the old growth. And now, now we've, you know, in California, I mean, it's just catastrophic fires. The same thing there. Uh, no management after, right. virtually after they took the old growth. <laughs> yeah, some of it is. I mean, uh, they've got private lands too, uh, and BLM lands. Uh, that could happen again here too. Oh, yeah, I'm bad. There is, though, this. I, I had a number of discussions with experts at the World Forestry Institute. And they do point out that uh, the last few years, fires have not just been in Oregon or California, and not in just in the American West, but also in Canada and around the in the forests around the world. Huge fires in Siberia, huge fires in Indonesia, huge fires in the Amazon. Uh, I mean, as the forests of the world have been cleared the fuel available with climate change and warmer forests and the whole thing is going up and smoking. <coughs> I mean, I was trying to find some possible solution for all this burning and smoke in cities. He pointed out problems every, every way where I turned, everything I came up with, he said, this is the problem with that, and so on and so forth. Go ahead. Another thing um, I ran into that um, pretty appalling to me, and I haven't researched what, what exactly happened. But um, living in Eugene for a number of years, uh, we used to go down to Cottage Grove oh, yeah. Reservoir and fish. There's a lot of trout in that lake, and a lot of people would go there on weekends. Or I grew up in Eugene, too. So. And it's poison. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah. It's been poisoned. Yeah, the, some mining up yeah, it's good. Oh, it's yes, so there's a bohemian mine. It's got lead mine. How lead can mine. that, I, I mean, it's yeah. poisoned. For, for, it's well, it's that's... Fun place now or <coughs> So what's, what's going on that these companies can just... Well, I was on a number of National Academy of Science studies on mining problems around the country. And what almost always occurs is that once the mines are played out, uh, the best ores are taken away, uh, the companies either abandon the site, uh, uh, many of them historically were never uh, remediated in any way. There's very little federal programs requiring remediation. Uh, and there and it's probably worse. For instance, in old shaft coal mines, uh, there need to be a seal, and sometimes there is. But uh, the, the waters inside are so acidic they eat away at the seal every 25 years. So, and the same happens with the uranium boreholes throughout the Four Corners area and the sulfide mines in the Rockies. Uh, we, and they, they poison the streams downstream uh, and the, the seals break through and uh, it's, there, we, we really need a program to tend them for all time. Yeah, uh, like putting, and, and I found after these studies I was part of and we wrote a report, so I went to friends we had in Congress and told them about the problem and we need to have a 
a big remediation program. They didn't even want to hear about it. All you guys do is bring us problems. I mean, we're overwhelmed with them. And we're having trouble getting things through Congress right now that we're doing on your behalf. And, uh, no, no more, no more. They just didn't want to hear it. Uh, and I ran into that again and again. Uh, so. You know what it really is? It's the God Almighty dollar. Oh, well, that's what drove it, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, the, 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 you know, the Tennessee Valley you now have all coal fly ash problems. And, uh, uh, however, however, uh, the water and air pollution programs, which we, or Congress enacted at the environmentalist instigation in the early 70s, they've done a lot of good. They haven't solved all the problems. Uh, uh, they've uh, improved the quality of the rivers of this country quite a bit. Uh, so 60% of the meat standards, 40% dough. Uh, those 40% are still in bad shape. Just talk about some of the causes, but it used to be 90% of them were in bad shape. So maybe, maybe the idea is to prohibit mining on our streams and lakes and it, so that doesn't continue to occur. And they do it right here in Santa Cruz. Well, they don't mind there, but if you look at the businesses that are Well, are we, right we've, there. I was a pre, yeah. I, I was a chairman of a, a group trying to reform mining laws and we never got anywhere, though we did a lot of good, but uh, the tenacious mining lobby that uh, we, we were, we were going to establish standards that, you know, to assess each prospective mine and uh, do an environmental impact statement and then to make decisions of whether it posed too many risks or, or not or whether you'd allow it on, at least on federal lands. But we never got it through. I mean, there's a, things are a little bit better than they used to be, but still unsatisfactory. Well, look at I, where we're talking a lot about contemporary problems. Uh, uh, I, I guess we were getting late here. Uh, uh, we're good. Pardon? We're doing good. All right. I would encourage you to buy his book. <laughs> 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 it's awesome.